If you haven't seen the introduction video for this Elizabeth project, I suggest that you check that one out first, just so you know a little bit more of what I'm talking about. But for today's video, I'll be discussing the accessories for her outfit. So I have a beautiful pair of bespoke shoes that I'll be talking about in the process for ordering those, my process for making the chemisette, and the process for making the very frilly and very lovely granny cap, as my mom calls it. So follow along, hopefully it all works out, and see how I did it. Oh my god. Ah! Before going into this project, I knew already that I didn't have a pair of shoes that would be super duper appropriate for this time period. So I took it as an opportunity to actually commission Margaret Hubley of Hubley Leatherworks based out of Ottawa to make me a pair of Regency slippers. Full disclosure, I do plan on continuing my career in museum work and living history, so I saw this as an investment towards my kit for things that I might need in the future going down that road. My mom paid for them as a graduation present, so thanks mom. And the process for actually getting them and getting them made was relatively straightforward. So I contacted Margaret Hubley and I said, hey, are you busy right now? I'm looking at having a pair of Regency slippers made. Here are some pictures that are inspiring to me. I'd want something similar to that. How much would it cost? And could you do them? And we corresponded a little bit just to discuss style, type of leather that I wanted to use, color, and all those kinds of things. And then I went on to measure my feet and also measure my insoles because the main purpose of getting these commissioned instead of just buying a pair of reproduction shoes was because I have very inconvenient feet and I wanted something that would accommodate for my insoles and give all my feet a lot of support, especially if I plan on wearing them for you know, days on end or at events or different things like that. So I measured my insoles as well. When they came in the mail, they were beautifully packaged, as you just saw, and it took me a while to break them in, but I actually wore two pairs of socks and would go on walks around the neighborhood, and I suffered, to be fair, because the leather was very, very stiff, but now that they've worn in quite a bit, they do fit my feet very, very well, and they're quite comfortable, especially with the insoles in them. I can walk around, I can wear them, and I can work in them. So all in all, I think that they definitely achieved their goal, and I would recommend her work if anyone else is interested, especially if you're located in Canada because shipping rates and exchange rates can often make products a lot more expensive if they're coming from outside of the country. I know a lot of other Canadian historical costumers have the same woes when it comes to things like that. So if you're looking for a Canadian artist, and interested in shopping local, I would recommend her work absolutely. And if you have any questions about the process or if you're interested in knowing more, you can leave me a comment or send me a message. I'd be happy to talk about it because these are definitely one of the most unique parts of my growing living history kit. And I'm really excited to be able to have something like this in my arsenal with a historic look on the outside, but being able to accommodate for some of those modern needs. So there you have it. I was really looking forward to making the chemisette because it's just one of those things that once you have it, you can wear it with so many different outfits. I chose the collared chemisette from the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking, and I used stash cotton fabric. So I followed all the instructions in the book and I made a few adjustments to the pieces just so they fit me a little bit better and they're a little bit bigger. And then I went ahead and sewed the majority of it by hand, like the drawstring casing and the hemming only sewing the shoulder seams and the collar by machine just because I really wanted to make sure that those were going to be sturdy. I also interfaced the collar so it would be stiff and stick up the way that I think it appears in the portrait and the way that I would just like to style it anyway. I use the same technique as my 18th century shirt collar which is a really great technique because it's the same for any collar and any set of cuffs. And I was really happy with this. 
One thing that I wish was different, and I actually went back and undid the collar and fixed the gathers to try to fix, but it didn't really end up working out, was that the back bunches up quite a bit and it's very visible when the dress is worn. Don't really know how to fix it. I wish I could change it, but I'm just gonna have to live with it. Onto the cap, I found a free pattern that I will link below. Here my mom is modeling it on the form and we use some really soft, silky stash fabric. After starting to assemble it and seeing it take shape, I started to think that maybe this wasn't going to be the right approach. And we eventually went on to drafting our own pattern, which is the final cap that we settled with. But making this cap pattern was fantastic and I think that if we had just picked a different fabric it would have been a lot better. The use of gathers to make this decorative gathered section on the top is really gorgeous and that's actually a technique that we stuck with in the second iteration of the cap. So it came in two pieces, the crown and the body, and then we reinforce some of the gathers with a strip of fabric underneath. And as Elizabeth Simcoe's cap is very frilly, we also tried our hand at taking some lace that we had and gathering it to see how that would look under the bonnet. We opted not to choose this lace in the end just because it didn't have the right look, but that's the whole point of experimentation. So all in all, I'm glad that we did it and we had to make the first cap to realize it wasn't gonna work before deciding to make the second cap, which ultimately did. So here's the second version made out of linen this time, and it worked a lot better because the linen is far sturdier than the other fabric that we tried to use. Basically, we kept all of the basic design elements from the previous cap, but we made quite a few changes as well, making a lot of the things bigger, adding more gathers in different places, making the cap crown bun holder thingamajiggy a little bit bigger. I call it the mushroom cap because of that. So Elizabeth Simcoe's bonnet is really frilly around the forehead, but not really anywhere else. So we decided that that meant that the ruffles were doubled up, but only on the forehead piece. To finish the edges, we folded fabric around the raw edges and it made it really sturdy and also just a really clean finish. And to finish the frills, we straight stitched along the length and then zigzag stitched along the edge. And it's a really clean finish that isn't bulky. And that's something that's really important for this because it's just a very frothy, frilly cap. And a lot of the construction seams and heavier, heavy duty bits are hidden underneath the actual hat. But the frills, we really wanted to make sure that those were light and airy. So here they are with them doubled up in the front and they're just curved on either ends to merge onto the single ruffle. And it looked really good in this stage, but it looks even better on the cap. The design, the way that we had it in our heads, my mom and I were doing a lot of back and forth for this. It worked exactly the way that I was hoping that it would. So here it is again, another shot of just reinforcing with this trim. I really like clean finishes, which is why this cap became very fiddly. But I'm happy that we put the work into it to try to figure it out because the end result is something that I really enjoyed. I feel really clever for this one because the decorative ribbon on the cap is actually attached with a few pins. I wanted to do it this way just in case, you know, the time comes and I feel like switching it up, I'm wearing a different outfit that has different colors in it, or maybe I just want to wear the cap plain. By fastening them with pins, it's really easy to remove the ribbon and I can always switch out the blue for another color and get a different look. 